All right. Welcome back to the PDR Coach Podcast. Today, I have a very special guest. Today will be a little bit different too. It's not. I'm not going to interview this guest as much as I am collaborate with this guest. Um, we will do a little interviewing for those of you that don't know him, but um, my guest today is Ryan Hampton. Um, Ryan and I met at the Mobile Tech Expo um, I was about a year ago now, the, the last one that we had <laughs> before everything got canceled. Um, and we're on today to talk about a little bit about, about what Ryan does at the 300 uh, Advantage and then talk about the future of our industry. Doesn't that sound fun? Welcome, Ryan. What's up? Hey, how are you, bud? I'm doing good. I'm excited. Hey. Yeah, we just talked, chatted for a little while before this and we're hitting record and we're going to talk, um, you know, we'll go into what is going on with you and your life, what you do. And then we're going to talk some future of PDR, which is all speculation and opinion, but it's fun to talk about. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> so for those of you that don't know you, Ryan Hampton, what what do you do? Well, um, I run a national hail catastrophe um, program mm -hmm. designed to do a couple different things, work with body shops, of course, work with dealerships on their inventory when it gets damaged. Um, and then uh, working with local companies as well that have hail in their area and um, they need help managing the chaos basically. So nice. Yeah. I can imagine I've never run, run a hailstorm or been in one, but um, I can imagine the chaos that would that would happen almost immediately, right? Like the hail falls and it's like, uh, now what do I do? Go find some hail cars. <laughs> yeah, and that's what you used to do. And a lot of people still do chase hail storms. And, uh, uh, but there's a lot more to a hail storm. And, and every time you have a hail storm in your area, mm -hmm. you get smarter. You, you learn. Yeah. Um, like the first time you might call a company like us, the second time you might contemplate it the third time you might not because you've gotten really well at it and sure. and that's a good thing and that's and that happens a lot but um there's more than just fixing hail and that's kind of where our company came around um you it's really it's we have a hail preparedness plan mm -hmm. so, and it's pretty in depth i sent you a copy the other day yeah i saw that a couple other people uh to see what their thoughts on it were and so far everybody really likes it but it allows you to not just look at a hail storm and say holy crap it just hailed um what do I do? Call this guy or start calling people, but it allows you to be prepared. So you don't miss opportunities when it does hail. If you know, once it hails, you've had a plan in place for not mm -hmm. just current accounts, but potentially new accounts. And you can use that hailstorm to grow your long-term company. So we've added a lot more pre storm initiatives versus yeah, yeah. just calling us ahead of the storm or when it tails, you call us, we get there in 24 hours and we say, okay, what do you got? And then we start planning around that. We like to have a plan six months ahead of time. So that's what we do. We help a local company prepare for hail and then uh, capitalize on hail. Gotcha. I want to, I wanna, and I, you said something the other day and I'll come back to that, but I'm, I don't actually don't know this answer to this question, but how did you get into PDR? What were you doing? Were you in the body shop before? Maybe I do know. I was, I okay. was, um, my dad owned a body shop since 1972. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. I started working with him in the early eighties when I was in high school, uh, Yeah. joined the Navy in 86, painted for four years, got out, worked in body shops, painted at car stars. And then a big storm hit St. Louis in 01. Mm -hmm. And I was pretty much on the job training with Randy Hukenen for about a year. PDR. Yes. In PDR. Yeah. Yeah, I took the plunge on my first hailstorm in um, 2002 in Coffeyville, Kansas. And ever since then, just every year, just paid nice. attention to what was going on. And and here I am today. That's cool. That's awesome. Yeah, that's that's uh, so you've been I mean, you've been in this in the, you know, automotive appearance or collision, whatever industry for pretty much your entire life. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. <laughs> yeah. It was a six month stint when I cleaned carpet when I first got out of the Navy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I couldn't find a job, but other than that, awesome. that's awesome. So yeah, you said something, um, and we do a lot, we've been on a clubhouse a lot too, and we, we push it a lot. We'll talk a little bit about more about that later, but you said something, um, on there yesterday, I think when we were talking and said that your hail money is made in January and February, something mm -hmm. like that. And it's like, oh, well that there's, there's no, there's not really hail in January or February, but your point being is that the big money can actually be made if you're ready for the hailstorm when it comes. And that's kind of what you guys do and help people do. 
And that goes the same thing for retail route technicians too. Like, you know, you can advertise and do these things and try to get all those jobs to come into the door. But, but unless you have a system and process to take care of those customers, once they come in, um, then there's no sense in, in marketing and advertising all, all of that first until you have that system ready. Right. Yeah. Um, and a hail readiness plan does that. That was actually mm-hmm. the child of my two partners, Tony and Bill, they brought it to me and I was kind of like, it sounds like there's a lot of work and it kind of, but after we, we did a, a body shop a couple of years ago, we did a hail readiness plan for them. And it was in a really heavy hail market and percentages are really high. Mm-hmm. And we went down there and spent two days with the estimators, the bays. I mean, it's really in depth. And the more, the more you put into it, the more you will get out of it. It is a chore. It's probably a two day thing to go through all the questions and fill in the blanks. Mm-hmm. When it hails, you know, every account you have, yep. you know, if they have space, you have a real estate agent that knows what you're going to be needing mm-hmm. for short-term rentals. I mean, nice. I go on and on. Do and you on. go as far as like having a part of your website ready to turn on, like landing pages or Google Ads ready to turn on? If yeah, okay, Google you're nodding ads. your head. People can't see that, but you're like, yes, yes, well, yeah, <laughs> yes. So there, there, there are uh, really, I guess, four different um, avenues, and it's your fleet, which is rental car companies, and maybe some municipalities. Yeah. You have your ships you have your body shops and then you have your retail customer retail. Mm-hmm. and each one of those has two segments current and potential mm-hmm. so how do you reach your current customers that you have your mailing list for or emails or, or whatever yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then how do you reach the new ones gotcha and, and same with body shops how do you get new ones ahead of time mm-hmm. uh, and and i'll go off track one second here yeah For example you might service three dealerships or five dealerships, but there might be 30 in your area. By having a hail readiness plan and hitting up those other dealerships one at a time and letting them know, you know, Johnny does their hail or their door dings rather. Yeah. But if it hails here, we are down the road. We don't want to step on his toes for his door dings, but if you need help with hail, we're here. And here is a miniature version, like an excerpt, if you will, from our hail readiness plan of how we can help you from mm. looking at your policy to looking at your space and helping you write estimates. And you'd be surprised what a five minute phone call with a GM that looks at you goes, all right, well, yeah. And that's all he says. But when it hails and you go back there, he's going to know who you are. Yeah, that's interesting too. I mean, yeah, because if you do that, I mean, that's going to, I would imagine, highly likely set you apart from the guy who's doing the door dings at the, at the facility. I no doubt about it. Cause if he goes, I mean, I can imagine this again, I'm not in that scenario, but I'm just guessing that, you know, the dealership might go to him and say like, you know, all these cars are damaged. Uh, you know, how can you help us? And he's like, I, I, I don't know. I'll fix them all. It'll take me two years. <laughs> I don't know what their answer would be, but if you're, if then the other guy comes by and he's like, Hey, I got this team. I got the people. Here's my process. Here's this. It's an easy choice for a GM. Essentially. Yeah, that's what you're saying. All yeah. the answers he has. He, he might pick and choose from the best account he has and says, man, if I sit down right here, I can work for the next six months yeah. and make more money than I've ever made in my life. Mm-hmm. And, and he can tell the other dealers, Hey, you know, you know, take your pick. I'll help you help just decide. And yeah. I'll help you see this stuff. There's a lot of variables or you can include him in your process. I yeah. mean, working together with somebody is always the best option. So sure. You know, People that have areas like that, they work together. They form alliances. I heard of there's some uh, people on the East Coast that form like East Coast Hail Alliances and they work together. Fantastic ideas. Yeah. So, but there's a lot of growth potential um, for making more money during a hailstorm. And there's a lot of growth potential for new accounts that you create because of a hailstorm by being mm-hmm. prepared. Um, there's a difference between calling a tech to put in a stall and a company to come in and help you grow your retail customers and every, whatever customer base you want, Hale is the incredible tool to make that happen. Sure. hundred. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. So that, that's the, uh, that's the overview of what you do at 300 advantage. Um, and in you know, there's a Facebook group and I was in that, I'm in that Facebook group and you posted a video. This is transitioning to talk about future of PDR. Um, in that you had an interview that you did with Mike Toledo, who we all know, um, seven years ago, eight years ago, talking about what the future of PDR holds. 
you know, which is interesting because now, you know, seven or eight years ago, now we're here in the future. Some of that stuff has come to fruition and some hasn't happened yet. I don't believe still being talked about, still being talked about. Um, there's been iterations. People have tried stuff and tried to make changes and, and we can, we don't need to go into every one of those, but yeah. the fact of the matter is that, you know, the industry will change. Um, we're still new. We still fly under the radar. We still aren't um, really looked at by any sort of organization, like any sort of um, organizations as far as stuff we have to do, like a body shop. Like if you do this at a body shop, here's the process you have to follow, manufacturer recommendations, all that. Like we're still just, we're still um, wild, wild west a little bit. And it will have to change whether we like, I mean, there's parts I like about that and there's parts that I don't like. The, the fact of the matter is as the industry grows, as there's more techs, as we fix more cars, as the cars change, the industry will change. Right. So just for fun, because you and I love to talk about this and we wanted to record, record ourselves so that other people could listen. Mm -hmm. Where's the industry going? Maybe a recap of what you talked about seven or eight years ago and what you think can still change now. Um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll go from there and get more granular. Yeah. Well, seven or eight years ago, the conversation with Mike is when I was with PR nation and that was getting fired up by me and a group of guys that were mm -hmm. working their tails off to, to do a nonprofit and it's still in play yeah. um, and it's, it's hard to, to see things through, but the overall goals at the time were, and the vision was where is the industry going and where, how, how is a local PDR company going to become a major player in his market? And, and how do you scale a PDR business versus any other business? And because like you said, public still don't know about us. Yep. Uh, a lot of people go, to body shops, work is directed to body shops. And then usually it needs to go to a body shop, but as a PDR business, you're a legitimate business. Mm -hmm. How do you establish yourself as an option for people to recognize your brand and your company yep. or your industry? And it and the, uh, the idea came down to, and I mentioned it in that video was the common denominator was certification, that if you all had a certification of some sorts. Yeah, something, yeah. yeah. And then it's not end all, but it's still something that's recognizable nationwide yeah. um, and hopefully worldwide at the time. And then the other part of it is time to start thinking about brick and mortar. And I said that in the video, you know, if you, if you were a, a claims funnel, whether you're a door ding company, uh, a warranty company or, or a claims management company or a municipality looking for work or looking for your cars to be repaired, where do you go to? And you're mm -hmm. going to go to the company that has the reputable website or a clean website. Um, you know, a brick and mortar building usually helps, not necessary. So yeah. just overall professionalizing your, your business in your area was what that video was about. And, right. and if you fast forward to 2021, yeah. um, it's still, it's still the, it's still true. And there are a lot more brick and mortar, not nice. because of the video, but it's, it's slowly evolved to the obviousness of that helps. Um, mm -hmm. See some really cool buildings out there too. Yeah, really for cool sure. But, um, but that's the future now. I think it's going to come down to, um, I think people outside businesses are going to start having more claims management companies using using claims management companies to, to get their cars repaired. Mm -hmm. So we're not necessarily talking direct repair. You're talking, you know, the city of Sacramento might have 600 vehicles and there might, they might use a claims management company and there's a mm -hmm. lot of them out there. And that claims management company will say here, here's our list of vendors. And, and those vendors have been pre-vetted based on whatever criteria. And, and I think the same thing can happen for every type of uh, funnel of work that comes out there, whether it's hail whether it's, um, you know, your, whatever it is, I think you're going to see more vehicles repaired by um, or managed by a claims management company. Yeah. Companies that are reputable. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, I I'm in, I'm in talks right now with uh, a company who's trying to do that through dealerships, okay. basically come in, manage, manage the, from when the vehicle drops to when it goes on to the used car lot, manage that process from vendors to mechanical to getting sent out to all the different places, whether it's another dealership. All that. 
yeah, whether it's another dealership because you know they're selling the Nissan at you know at the Ford dealer and they got to send it over there for the one warranty thing or all that. Like the uh, someone comes in and manages that for the dealership because the dealership wants to buy cars and sell cars. They don't necessarily want to be in the business of of getting them all fixed up. They do that. They have used car managers and recon managers and lot guys and this. But if you could hire a company to come in and do that for you. That's that's definitely tempting as a uh, as a dealership, and they can focus on buying and selling cars. Um, so that's interesting you say that, and you're saying potentially in the insurance side or the body shop side of things too. You might you're thinking that the future might hinge a little bit around around that. Maybe is is it you think maybe insurance companies insurance companies being the one that that delegate that to other people, or or what are you thinking? That's a good question yeah. so with what you said about that dealership. Uh, yeah. thing, um, I think a smart business owner, whether you're a dealership owner, body shop, insurance company, or PBR tech, mm -hmm. the smartest ones, if they can have a conversation with somebody and somebody brings them a pre ready process and SOP, and they can deal with one, one phone call, one person, they have one, one invoice. Yes. Yeah. And, and, if, and if their costs, don't go up because of that yeah then, then that's a great thing that's a really important phone call that i'm not going to take oh no let's all hear it no. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one i've been waiting for him to call but no, oh no i'm sorry bad timing no, on the podcast i have you will see if this is a good example so that is um the guy in charge of enterprise for three states and we're talking hail okay Nice. That's fun. Yeah. So when you guys call me and text me and I don't answer, I <laughs> put priority on the person that I am talking to at the time. There you go. That is a good example. So even I'm, if it's not as important, <laughs> like this podcast. Yeah, yes. But um, no, everybody is important. I mean, I know. Yeah, I get a lot of slack for not answering my phone, and that's that's why. So it gets it gets harder and harder for sure as I've grown and and coach more people and talk to more people and make bigger deals and talk to the people who are implementing those things at dealerships. It definitely gets harder to to um you know balance all of that. There's people on Instagram DMs and text messages and phone calls, and then obviously running two businesses and and having a wife and kids and you know all that stuff. Why we we're gonna do this podcast last week? And it's like I gotta do wrestling. Or what was it? You had to take your kid somewhere. It's like, that's priority. You got to do those things. Um, I'm like, Hey, my wife told me, so I put yeah. it on my calendar. And now this week we had the podcast on the calendar. Yeah. That guy from enterprise needs to, needs to, uh, oh, you've frozen up on me there. Yeah. That or you're staring intently at some. No, we're, it'll take a second. We'll get back there. The audio still goes, even though the video's lagging a little bit. Um, there. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, there you are. You froze up for a second. So yeah. I don't, I don't want to get sidetracked because if you know me, I do that. <laughs> the process of a single process for somebody is extremely attractive. And then on the insurance side, you asked if they're doing that. I mean, I'll, I'll add to that real quick too. Like, this is what I teach my clients. This is what I work on with my clients. Like, as a PDR company, we should be focused on, you know, taking care of running our business and fixing dents. So if I can outsource a CRM or outsource my uh, advertising management or outsource uh, a lot of that other stuff, do that because that's not where your zone of genius is. Like you need to be talking to customers, quoting cars and fixing dents. If you can outsource all the other stuff, fantastic. Same thing with dealerships. They need to be buying cars, working with their salesmen on how on how to talk to customers, how to sell them, how to do all, the, all those types of things. They don't need to be as worried about you know, the, the used car manager shouldn't be walking around the dealership, you know, pointing out dents to the dent guy for two hours a week and, or times, like times that. seven vendors, right. That's, you know, how many hours a week anyway. So, so every, every little business should do that. And that, that could potentially change the way that dealers work with vendors in the future. Yeah. And we, so our hail readiness plan, I'll allude to that yeah. again. We did some, and, and again, this was Tony and Bill's uh, brainchild and I wasn't, a huge fan of it because I've always been a firm believer that when it hails, you know, all bets are off and money talks. And <laughs> so it, it hailed at a handful of them last year. It, it did. And we went in there and um, uh, we're like, we actually got the accounts and, and, and it wasn't at the market uh, discount. It was a better discount mm -hmm. than the current market. And they were big shops and um, the, the, the national PDR companies that normally would go in there we're not in there because we had 
gone through the process of them. Another, another, I mean, I'll give away all the information for the hail readiness was to go yeah. to the, your big shops and go, Hey, if it hails here, I know you have a deal with your, your biggest insurance carrier is X and they have an agreement with this company. Can you reach out to them and find out if it's okay if we handle your claims because, and here's how we will do it. So again, it's an in-depth process, but it's extremely valuable. So these shops went with us for the same reason that that dealership thing you're doing is because it's a streamlined process and you know, it works. Mm -hmm. So yeah. service, strong service with a process around it is a massive sales tool mm -hmm. for, for, for day to day accounts and for hail. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, most, so most people who follow me know that I'm a route retail tech, a mobile guy specifically. We actually do have a shop that we at times have gotten more work in our shop than we do mobile, but back and forth. Um, so we do have a shop, but we, I would say we're not, I'm not a shop retail location. We don't fully push that. A lot of what I do is mobile. Um, I know that the future of PDR is in a shop. I get that. Um, you want to talk to that a little bit? Why, why is it in a shop? Um, why, especially for the retail and insurance side of things, why do we think, cause I agree with you. Why do, why do we both think that that's the future of PDR? Just, is it the legitimacy? Is it the fact that insurance companies really don't want to, don't want to, I don't know if I can say the word steer, don't want to recommend people go to PDR places if they're not, if they're not shops. What, what's your, what's your take on that? Well, I, I think it's a pretty much what you said. Um, yeah. One, I think you're spot on with you having a shop, but you're not necessarily promoting that. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have repairs come in that are going to need to be in a building for a day or two, or you're going to be in the garage for a day or two. So yeah. number one, that is a huge benefit just for you as a shop owner. Yeah. Uh, that's one. Number two, I do think there's some legitimacy around it because while a lot of people don't know who our industry is, um, people that deal with PDR claims, they know very well what our industry is. And to see somebody, um, you know, temporary, mobile, just doesn't lend. Um, a lot of their customers don't want to have somebody show up at their door or show yeah. up at their work. Like Safe Flight Auto Glass pulls it off. They yeah. do. Right. There's there's the case to be made for that, right? Yeah. yeah there is. Um, but when you're talking about a dent on your vehicle, I think a customer feels like, and I'm just speculating here that that's the type of um, service that you would expect to have to take somewhere. Um, yeah. You know, because again, you tell them you're painless dent repair and how, what percentage of people do you think believe you're still painting their vehicle? A lot, a, lot. <laughs> a yeah. large percentage. Yeah. So when you say, Hey, I'll come to your house. I mean, that this, it might be a, something as simple as, Dang, you're going to be painting my driveway. Yeah. Right? That's weird. All right. I guess this guy knows what he's talking about. So our industry until it, <laughs> gets to that level um i think a shop lends um legitimacy to yeah and, and i think it's interesting too because i think the fact that we have a shop has helped us with some of those relationships with insurance companies and things like that but once i talk to the customer majority of them are still okay with mobile so so it's interesting i think for now it's still just the fact we have the shop and we have that as an option. And sometimes we take bigger repairs there. If I'm taking doors off or hail damage, a lot of times we'll do it in the shop. Sometimes I do it in my own personal garage too, but um, like my actual garage, I don't have like my own shop or anything um, at my house. But, um, but the fact that we have that and it is an option makes, gives us more legitimate. We're still able to do a little bit of mobile repairs. So I think, I don't think mobile repairs ever goes away because it's like a weird dynamic. The entire world for the most part, especially in 2020 with everything we went through has shifted to, you know, mobile ship it to me, deliver it to me, bring it to me. Like I never have to leave. I'll just tip you for bringing my grow everything. So it's interesting that the whole world is shifting that way. And in this industry, we're like, we got to go brick and mortar. <laughs> I find it funny. Um, it might be true. It might be, it might be the real reason, but I think there's still going to be a segment of the world that still wants that mobile repair. So I think having the ability to offer both, down the road is going to be, is going to be super important, especially for the route retail guys. Yeah. But, if you think about it, we're talking about the future. So yeah. Um, and I don't even know if I've ever even heard this conversation come up and just kind of came to me. We mentioned safe light and mobile. Yeah. So notice a lot of the companies that are, I'm not saying not a lot of them, but uh, companies that do glass repair are also the same companies that are getting into the ADAS calibration. 
um, because they're putting the glass in and they have the sensors yeah, and yeah. Have to do that. So another thing to think about, and this isn't the sky is falling. This is just, we're talking future. Um, a 20 minute door ding job or dent job or a quarter panel job may not be able, it might need a bigger process around it if right. the new safety standards are coming up. So, so the lady or the gentleman needs to bring his car to your shop because number one, you have the building and the ability to do that and yep. you can repair it, but it also has to have other processes done on that. I mean, with all the OEM statements and all the safety precautions, if you bring in a Subaru or a BMW yeah. and you fix those dents and you pull a mirror or whatever, the, whatever it is, yeah. then it needs to have the next step done, which is the, the recalibration, the pre and post scan. hundred percent. That's rapidly, that's rapidly changing in our industry. Um, for now, my way around that, because we have so many techs and we don't want to out and we don't have a shop, we all mobile and we don't want to outfit everybody with pre and post scanners. If we run into that situation, because it's so few and far between right now, we run them through a body shop because we have so many relationships with body shops that we run it through a body shop and they can do the th those things we need and we'll sublet out and we'll, we'll figure out the billing that way, but give it three, four, five more years. And most of the stuff we work on is late model vehicles. It's going to be really, really, really tough to do. You know, yeah. it's going to be really tough to do that and and to not give away that business and we need to keep it and capture it. So hundred percent. And I mean, still there's stuff that's floated around. It's like, you know, I've, I read this thing one time through the Toyota manufacturer specs that if you like move the belt molding or wedge it open, then you have to like replace the belt molding because the seal of the door and all like that's been around for a while. And, you know, I don't actually work at any to Toyota dealers, but I know dent guys work at Toyota dealers and we shove a wedge down there or and and fix a dent and, and move on um and then if the airbag if, if it has a side impact and the airbag does not feel the pressure like it's supposed to that's what they say yeah and that's just a simple deal i mean if you take a mirror off you don't recalibrate it the lady that's used to depending on that blinking yeah. mirror yeah. is going to hit the car next to her now yeah. sure if you look in her mirror that's what the mirror is for yeah <laughs> and it on the, the lane center yeah. alarm yeah so there's a lot there. And again, the sky isn't falling. This is the future. So it is the future. It's definitely, it's definitely coming. Um, maybe a little bit quicker than we believe. You have a building and you have a repair coming yeah. in. You, you have, you have the place to park the car. Yeah. Yeah. You have the ability to reach out to, if you're subbing out your pre and post scan, whether it's Aztec or one of those companies, Yep. you have um, any calibration done. I know there's companies like Elite out there that will do that. Mm -hmm. or the gas company i mean you have to have space to do that and and i can see if you think about a pdr company that's getting growing that's the thought here right yep if you're going through 10 15 cars a day i see pdr companies being the next um option for other businesses in the area to come to to recalibrate their cars or to do uh this i mean to do well maybe not pre and post can because they can either have their own or, or do the remote, but yeah. the calibration goes hand in hand with what a PDR company does if they have the space. So again, you don't have to, but if I'm going to set up a building in Columbus, Ohio and start and prepare for the next five to 10 years, That's, I'm, I'm looking into it's on the space. list. Yeah. yeah. And ADAS is one of them. Yeah. Um, the MTE kind of changed subjects, but not really. MTE is the auto reconditioning and smart, repairs or something is their little tagline um we don't hear i don't hear that a lot the smart repairs um so if you don't know what it means the s-m-a-r-t smart is small to medium area repair technology um we pdr is a smart repair so i don't know what small to medium means because i'm i see some guys out fix out there i see some guys fixing stuff out there i would say is large <laughs> maybe it's some small, small art. I don't know if you'd say it. small, medium, large area repair technology. Anyways, the point being is like, we're not, we're not doing reframing. We're not, you know, replacing quarter panels and things like that. It's smart repairs are PDR touch up small interior repairs, windshield chips, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I do see the industry. What's that? It's like cosmetic versus structural. Sure. Yeah. Cosmetic. There you go. That's a good way to put it. Thanks for reducing my two minutes into a sentence. Uh, <laughs> doing that to me so <laughs> <laughs> i have been yeah um so i see the industry going that way more of like um the you know there's auto spas or this or smart repair shops and things like that where um people are bringing those repairs to one facility um whether it's pdr detail 
wind, uh, windshield chips, etc. Um, I know a few people doing stuff like that. What, what is your thought on that? You, you have any guys that are kind of broadening what they do besides just PDR or at least yeah. partnering with people or, or what? There, there's, there's people in particular. I mean, you know, we have our Axiom shops in Colorado. Yep. Mm -hmm. Get there and there's two in England and it's the same concept um, due to small to medium area. Um, where we've added, we're beginning to add some light structural to the shops in Denver because we're sending too many cars away. Um, so that's happening. But there's, um, there's guys like Eddie, Eddie Martin, Dent Devil in California. I don't know if yep. you know him. He's been doing it for a long time. Yeah. And I don't, I don't really keep up with him, but I know he, he did okay. Um, Matt Erickson's another guy. He, he was picking our brain a couple of years ago. Like, you know, I want to do it in Omaha. And he went quiet. And yesterday on the clubhouse, you heard him say, we offer paint. Yeah. I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah people are gravitating towards that and it's a different it's a different business but um you're you you you're going to be either more married to that building all day or have another expense that's going to cut into your profits by hiring somebody mm -hmm. to manage mm -hmm. that's a non-production yeah. person so that's it's a but there is a lot to um that being in the future i can see now there's been other body shops that have, have that have a current body shop and are creating a second body shop that is going to be re express repair. So you right. have your regular claims. And then if it's an express repair, they, they get rid of that log jam at the paint booth by, by triage and cars over to the other shop. So sure. cars at this shop are cycle time for a lot quicker mm -hmm. than the other ones, but they're according to the hours on the car. So there, there is a lot of different angles and people are looking at those smart repair shops. Totally. I totally agree with that. And that's something that we're looking at, you know, down the road is, you know, how do we make sure that we're get, giving the customers what they want? I mean, I, I, I have a, I, we're, there's a lot of people that we don't serve because we don't do all those other things. I, I have a network of people that I, that I refer to for now, uh, just like it's my get around for, um, for not offering all that stuff, but have a shop, have, other people in there, I think there's that's definitely something that could happen down the road with the PR industry as well. Yeah, it's um, interesting on those shops because the body shops have they have a train wreck of a car. Mm -hmm. so you could have one door, and while your process is done in hours and theirs is weeks, the when you're done with it, the process that takes place at that point with all the safety, you're 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 identical. You have to go through pretty much the same process as they did. So. Um, that process is the same. So it's going to be true. how it comes here. But I do believe that. I do believe more and more smart repair shops. And talking hail, bring that back in. Those yeah. are the shops that are going to get um, more customers coming in so they don't have to take it to your shop for PDR and then down the road for the hood or roof. For sure. Yeah, totally. Whenever we talk on Clubhouse or even, even together or with a group of people, a lot of times the direct or the conversation ends up in the insurance world. Um, and you, we've laughed about that too. We like try to make rooms or have conversations with people. It's not about insurance and it ends up there. Uh, it's fascinating. And I think partly because they are such a big, they're such a big player. I mean, they control so much of the market. They control so much of the uh, what's in customers heads. They control so much of the body shop. So, and there's pros and cons to that. Like, do, you know, do we want, to get work from insurance companies, a hundred percent, they control a massive amount of workflow. Do we want to be in bed with them or whatever you want to call it? Like body shops is where they control what we do. Maybe, maybe not that far. So how do we, as an industry, you know, yeah. and I know we don't have an answer for this. It's all speculation. How do we be able to get insurance companies or insurance agents and things like that to think PDR first but not have to go like full on sign on the dotted line DRP. Good luck ever leaving the DRP and, and be in successful situation. Well, <laughs> How do we know? That, that is a very volatile topic. In yeah. PR, in it body is. Shop and, and every, I mean, even the, even the health industry. So it is, I think the smartest way to approach that um, is maybe to not look at it from what, my opinion is or your opinion or anybody's opinion but what are the legalities behind it and and what is just what is actually going to happen or is happening and and if something is going on and you and somebody says to you hey we can bring you 
or refer customers to you and it's completely legal and this is how we're going to do it and do it and, and then if there's concessions involved obviously you hope there's not definitely it cannot be on the quality and the safety yeah, so for sure. if there's concessions involved i think it's up to an individual person to say yes or no and and you, you just look at it from a real point of view rather than an opinionated point of view um and I yeah. think those individual conversations take place and um, over time, a pattern will develop and, and, and it's going to happen. And obviously, you don't want to give away the farm, but you got to be smart. And, yeah. Um, and and to, to speak in frank words is like, you know, over the last five, six, seven years, we've worked really hard as an industry to raise prices, especially on the retail work. And it's been very successful. You know, Paul Corden at the top of that list with his pricing guide and things like that. He's huge that. what's that he's pioneered yeah the, the very important right <clears throat> but there is a there is a relationship between pricing and volume right like i i don't use the paul cord pricing guide at my dealerships <laughs> because i do 15 cars a day right so it's a bulk rate price so th so there is there we have to acknowledge the fact that that relationship exists between price and volume. It does in every industry in the world, whether it's retail or wholesale. If you order a thousand parts from me, I'll make it for this much. If you order one, here's the price, right? And so that relationship between PDR companies and insurance companies will hinge on that volume thing, right? And I mean, though that's the, I'm guessing that's the argument they make for the DRPs. Like, hey, sign up DRP and we'll give you X amount of claims per day. And here's the price you have to do it. Right. So I, I, I mean, there, my point being is that if I could say, okay, I'll give this percent percentage off of retail, or this is the price that I'll do it for. And there's on the other side, you know, they're giving me a certain amount of workload. Um, concession, like you said, concessions can be made on pricing. It doesn't mean that it's a disservice to the industry or that like everything should be full, full retail price guide or anything like that. Um, but I guess I I, I, that's the I, idea. I don't, I'm sorry. I, I might've misspoke. I don't think it would be concessions on pricing. So, and I can honestly say, and I, I would venture to say, you can probably say that. Have you ever had an insurance company say, do this for less based off of your matrix? No, me neither. And, but, and, but I've never had them. I've never had them say like, I want to give you 20 cars a week. What can yeah. you do? So yeah, I don't yeah. know, but I, I, yeah, I do agree with you what you're saying. And the cool thing about our industry, and I think this is where you're going. So sorry to interrupt you, but that we're always, we're, I say always, but most of the time, a very significant number will be cheaper than a body shop. And that's our comparison. Yeah. yeah. But even, even in the numbers. So, I mean, body shops that we've worked in in the past have had DRPs and the cat drive set up and there are 20, 30, 500 claims that come through. And, and there have been concessions been asked and we've seen the ones like we don't pay for double panel or, you know, we don't pay for glue pull or, or whatever that is, but everybody's seen those comments over the years, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you personally in my 20 years, I remember one, they called him a rogue adjuster that was like that, but it wasn't a company policy. And there's a huge difference there. So, and I, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that they're not going to ask for concessions. It's been talked about forever. Yeah. I just have not seen it other than companies going, okay, does this really need to happen? Um, NAPDRT performed a, a time study. I forget what it was called on aluminum a few years back to see yeah. how much more time. Mm -hmm. So I mean, an insurance company isn't going to participate on that if they're not willing to do it at all. They just want to understand it, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but we're not just talking insurance companies. We're talking dealerships, fleets. There's a lot of things out there. But as far as concessions, I can see them wanting you to write estimates. I know they do that. Hey, yes. you, you write the estimates, you get an opportunity to do the work. Yeah. Um, but you just got to pay attention to the legalities of it. The um, you know, the uh, integrity is, is, it a, is it a good deal? And we don't know where that's going. Big companies are doing it. I don't know the details behind the deal. I know that I've worked there and the matrix doesn't change. It might not go up, but it didn't go down. Yeah. Yeah. So it's still, it's still it, your percentages change, but it's sure. not a lot of times it's not retail matrix though, either. It's their matrix, right? To be but fair. It is. And, and 
people get pissed when I kind of say that they get they get mad when they hear this. But the truth is the truth. If you have a matrix and they have a matrix and you write a six thousand dollar estimate and it's six thousand two hundred and seventy five bucks. And then there was two fenders that had dime sized dents on them and there's a 65 and yours a 75 and you lost $10 on a $6,300 bet. Um, at that point, man, I'm picking my battles. I mean, yeah, yeah. you don't write dimes anyway. There's hardly ever a dime sized dent in, in hail yeah. anymore. So um, overall, I have not seen the concessions. It, it could happen in the future, but if it is, I don't think it's going to be around quality price or, um, safety i think it's just going to be around the, the management piece mm -hmm. that's you know, awesome we, we need you to have a manager here we need you to have quality control we need you to have insurance and un understand the liability and perform these safety tasks yeah yeah and, I, and i'm sitting here and i mean i mean i'm trying to put every time i do podcasts i try to put myself in the spot of a listener right i listen to a lot of podcasts and books and things like that and i and uh and I, th I think like sometimes I'm listening to the podcast and I'm like, why aren't they saying this? You know, and I'm like, and sometimes they do. And then sometimes they don't. And I get disappointed. But I just want to to be clear as we kind of wrap up here a little bit. Um, the future of the industry is created by us. Yes. Right. So we're speculating about the future and what can be in this and that or whatever. Um, the future is created by us. You know, there's there's a handful of guys or a few hundred guys or whatever, a small number of the, of the PDR industry that is involved in what's going on that is trying to move the industry forward, whether it's through a podcast or through training people in physical PDR training or the 300 advantage or the coaching that I do or whatever, right? There's people trying to move the industry forward. So as we speculate about what happens in the future of PDR in this industry, you know, you and I are both actively working on trying to create that future that we want to see. Right. Um, and so just so you guys know, like we, if, if you have ideas, if you've listened to something on this podcast that you're like, why didn't they say this? Or I think it's going to go this way. Or I think it, I think this, like, that's awesome. I, I know I would love to hear about it. I know Ryan would too, but reach out to us and say, Hey, what about this? What do you think about this? Like, how does this play into what the future looks like? Because I know you and I, Ryan, separately and now more so together are actively trying to push the industry forward in ways that we want to see it be, right? Yeah. And I, and I think in order to do that, uh, we talked about, you know, what values were earlier. Yeah. I think another value is, um, camaraderie like if you're if you're connected like not necessarily well, kind of like an organization but yeah. not an organization not a not a not a not a franchise but just yeah. like I mean, we've had talks about this yeah know, we have mm -hmm. around you know how 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 valuable is it for um a claims management company or any sales portal or any claims portal at all to see you know my company name or your company name or 50 other companies names and go there's 10,000 of these guys and they're just it's like herding cats of businesses so right, yeah. um, versus when you see um an mso mm -hmm. like a car star caliber app yeah. they're all out there they know they got name recognition but mm -hmm. you don't want to start franchises you don't i mean you don't yeah you don't, so yeah that's the struggle that we've had is like you know, consolidation in industries is, yeah. is almost inevitable. It happens in every industry. Um, the we've, we've witnessed this for the best example we have, we've witnessed in the body shop world over the last, you know, I mean, it's been a long time, but especially the last five years, caliber has came and gobbled up. Uh, I mean, they're, and then they merged with, with Abra and now they're, you know, 1200 or so shops, right. Massive. Um, consolidation happens before 50 years ago, it was solo, it was solo body shops everywhere. There was no big names, the biggest, you know, the biggest, I don't know. I'm just guessing. Yeah, and again, you come back to processes and services yeah. are the same. Yeah. Now, now you've got, they might consolidate, but now you have an, an entity knows that if they go to that business, it's like going to, uh, Outback. If you walk into an Outback, you know, exactly what's on the menu. It's set up the same. It's yeah. the same way. There's so much value and consistency and you know what you're getting. Yeah. And look, I mean, look, look at the world. Like they're in a, in about 30 minutes from here, they just put in a new mall. It's the first mall they've put in in our area in a while. And like you walk through that place and like every single fucking place in there is a brand name. 
Yes. It's like, it's like a Chick-fil-A and a Taco Bell and an In-N-Out burger, at least on the West coast. And uh, I don't know, I could go, I get the haircut places, the sports clips, the movie theaters and AMC, the, like the target is in there and like all, like (laughs) it's pretty rare, whether for better or for worse, you know, we, the, the mom and pop shops like that, they don't see them as much anymore. They're either being purchased, purchased up or pushed out or something. And we are the mom and pop shop. Now there's bigger yeah. PR companies out there, but not with a brick and mortar presence. Right. So- I mean, if you take out Dent Wizard, which I know they're the big one, and we can and and a quick overview of Dent Wizard from everything that I know, and maybe Ryan, you can help me if I'm wrong here, but um, Dent Wizard got backed by um, hedge funds or a version of a hedge fund, basically money backed. And their process was to grow as rapidly as possible um, and, in, and enter into many different, so P, they do PDR keys and all that stuff. So they grew as rapidly as possible. They have a training facility that they train people as fast as they can and push them out. Um, and the reason they were able to grow so fast and do that is because they were backed by money. So yeah. so kind of like Caliber Collision, the same thing. They're backed by by um i can't think of the name it's not a hedge fund i can't think of i think i got the GameStop thing in my head here but it's not a hedge fund I'll, maybe i'll think of it but it's 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 an organization that backs in with money that's like caliber inclusion does too they have massive organization backs by money they're not necessarily trying to turn profit every month but their 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 proposition is growth yeah, right I think it's void or void group. i could be wrong I it's what the void i don't know if void owns them or void is part of their corporate caliber name. Yeah. I don't know. I'd have to look it. I'd have to look it up again. I, I, I did know at one point, but anyway, so like Silicon Valley out here in California, a big thing like Uber and all these big companies, right. They're not for, I don't even think actually Uber makes a profit today and they especially don't in 2021, but 2019, I don't think they even actually made a profit month to month. Their proposition, their value proposition is growth. And I think debt wizard was on that same path of like of massive growth more so than profits per month. But us for small businesses, like, we we're not backed by that kind of money. Like we actually have to make money and then use that profit to pay our bills and then maybe reinvest into our business. Um, anyways, that was a side note, well, but a good side note, five, six years ago when I had the Hale company going, I made a little logo called the Hale company Alliance. Yeah. And all the local companies that were working with us, um, I would, they would put it on their website and it was just a little link, a one page landing page. Yeah. And say, hey, or part of the Health Company Alliance. Yeah. And if it here, we got to cover it and they can promote that to their accounts. Sure. Some simple, like, it doesn't have to be major, right. big, but there is a ton of value in name recognition. Right. I, I totally agree. It was perfect. Yes. Totally agree. So, so take that wizard out of it, mm-hmm. out of the equation of PDR. Um, what's the next biggest company? Well, that maybe Dent Smart, I don't know, 30, 50 guys. Benchmark is a is a well run organization. Yeah. I don't know the exact. Um, I, I don't want to speak the wrong, but I I get this is just me. I believe it's franchises. I, I, it I think franchise. some yeah it is. And then, yeah. but there's different um, organizational structures. Yeah. But it works for them. They have a they yeah. have a they have a presence like that. Um, that wasn't just known because we're the first. And anytime you're the first, you're well. They're by far the largest too. Yeah. Zero they, question about that. They're massive. massive yeah. So, so, so w- when, when you and I talk about speculate on what's going to happen in the industry, go back to consolidation and things like that. Um, it's weird that there's no competitor to Dent Wizard and there should be as far as name recognition. Right. I mean, when, when Dent Wizard goes really? in, there is competition to Dent Wizards. It's you. Yeah. Well, sure. It's me. It's everybody else. There's more of us than there is of them, but that's true. Connected, you're not competition it's, that's true that's it, why i've seen all those factions of vikings a long time ago coming together <laughs> otherwise you're just getting their butt. And, and good for den wizard i mean yeah. you don't want to hear that but they're in business to make money and they they keep their mouth shut and yeah. they focus on their business and they make money and they go home to their families no yeah. different than anybody else right for sure so, yeah but when they as far as like making a contract with carmax um they're the only ones that have the ability to do that <laughs> as far as and I know right now, probably. Yeah. But we, you and I know we've had conversations around how um, that could be something that um, right. 
individual companies can be a part of. And that's what we're trying. That's what, you know, without, you know, talking too much depth on it. Um, and again, reach out to us if you want to know more, but that's what we're trying. That's what we're trying to accomplish in a nutshell, right? Yeah. These types of conversations, how we can change the industry and how we can do it in a way where we can bring the fragmented part of this industry, all the people in different situations under an umbrella of sorts that we can, that we can compete with big guys like that. Yeah. And there's different umbrellas out there now, but it's when you're talking thousands and thousands of claims, mm -hmm. how, like where you live, you live in the Sacramento area. Did I hear you yep, say that? That's right. How many, how many vents that fit your criteria right now happen every single day in that area? Hundreds. But Millions. having them find you is a whole different story. So sure. it's, just, it's just finding that, and there's a lot of those third-party administrators that handle claims, small, mm -hmm. big ones, um, independent adjusters. Um, the claims bridge is another one that we've talked about a lot yep. lately yep. That, that we're trying to work with. So um, it's coming and it's going to be done correctly. And the people that are banded together under the same, not under the same umbrella, but same philosophies and- sure. Core you know, values, recognizable by a, by a common bond of some sort, are the yep. ones that are going to be at the forefront. Now, does it work or not? You never know. You don't know until you try. You don't know until you try. <laughs> I agree. Funny, our conversation the first day, like we were like we were talking like we had we were old high school teammates <laughs> for forty years because like I can't. I'm, you're like we're bouncing each other's ideas. We're saying the same things. It's like yeah, it's, and and. I've talked to a dozen people since you and I talked, whether it's people reach out to me through clubhouse or I put something on my Instagram and some, some will reach out to me or whatever. And uh, I, a lot of people are thinking this, like, this is not, I, I know, you know, you and I aren't the only people that have thought this. We're not the only smart guys out there that have thought like, Oh, I wonder how, you know, we compete with the big guys. I wonder how we uh, get, get deals from insurance companies and how we make deals with big, um, big uh, wholesale accounts and things like that. Like a lot of people are thinking it. A lot of people have been thinking it. And hopefully you and I, with the help of a lot of other smart people can try to find an option that works. Yeah. I heard Mark Cuban say one time, somebody said, if you were 23 years old right now and you had to start fresh with nothing, live in your mom's house, what would you do? And he said, multi-level marketing. <laughs> and that's what he said, because I know we see people on our Facebook accounts that are selling. Yeah. And we're like, oh, we block them. We're not blocking them. Stop following because we want to see their sales, yeah. keto stuff. But if I had to start over right now, knowing everything that I know and everything mm -hmm. that I've been through, and I had to open Ryan's Dent Repair or St. Louis Dent Repair was the best name I had at the time. And there was an opportunity for me to become part of a network that we're talking about 100% I am in because it's taking all a ton of legwork out and it's bringing validity to me right away. And I'm not just saying that I would be excited about being, being a part of that company. Yeah. I mean, we did, we did that. I mean, that, that idea. Yeah. When my dad started, it was with Dent Pro right into the franchise model. Um, we're not a franchise anymore, but we're still licensed that name because it brings so much value to us. So I, I a hundred percent agree with you. Go back to uh, from the beginning of PDR training, right? Can you learn to fix dents on your own? Yes. If you pay a trainer to help show you how to do it, will it get you there faster? Yes. Okay. To coaching what I do. Uh, can you build a business on your own and figure all this stuff out and read books and listen to podcasts and call, call Ryan if he answers his phone and call other people and put together a, a thing to make you grow your business. Can you do that? Yes. If you hire somebody to help you show you all the, all the ways and all the mistakes that have been made and the things that go forward, will it be faster? Yes. I want to, we want to take that same thing and apply it to this, right? Can you grow your company bigger? Can you start a shop? Can you get deals with insurance companies, big things like that? Can you do it on your own? Yes. If you, enter into an organization that is already doing that, that is building a rec a brand recognition. Will it, will it happen faster? Yes. That's what I hope. Yeah. And there's so many different funnels out there too. Yeah. And, and hail is what I'm in obviously, but we also, we have hail, but we also have our local PDR company in St. Louis yeah. and in Colorado. And yeah. we have our smart repair shops in Colorado. And then we have the smart repair in PDR in England. So we see all those different angles and they all say, the same thing it connection connected to an entity now i would want to keep my name i would want to keep my yeah. little repaired. i yeah. wouldn't want to be a, a, 
a dent pro, nothing against your name, and you don't want to be Ryan. The best dent. name, but so keeping your company name, but just still being a part of a consolidated network that brings brand recognition, trust, and um, a good sales funnel yeah. to the future of a very competitive market that's only going to get worse. I think that's the best summary that was what we're looking at. I agree. Yeah. If you want to join us in these conversations, Ryan and I talk a lot on Clubhouse. If you don't know what Clubhouse is, it's probably the next app that becomes big. The last one was TikTok. Um, you know, so it'll it'll start entering into those conversations of Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, you know, all those. And Clubhouse is up and coming. Clubhouse is an audio platform only. I would say what I've told people, it's a, it's like a podcast and a zoom call had a baby in my opinion. Um, you can hop in and out of rooms. Um, you can start rooms with other people. It's not as organized and video and all set up like a, like a zoom call. It's much easier to get in and out of, but it's only audio. And I know all you guys listen to audio because um, I know how many people download my podcast and I know how many people listen to audiobooks and all that stuff. Uh, Clubhouse is a live version of a podcast but in a setting with a zoom where many people can jump in and out and multiple voices can come in. So Ryan and I both like it. Um, go check us out on there. If you're not on clubhouse, find me on Instagram. I think everybody listening to my podcast follows me on Instagram maybe and DM me and I'll get you in there. Um, and if you, if you have any questions or any ideas or any like, Hey, I have this thought, or you want to get in touch with Ryan. Um, if you hear us talking about anything on this podcast and you need, and you want to reach out to us, or have an idea, DM me or email me. Either go to my website at coachcoryk.com or DM me on Instagram and I'll get you in touch with Ryan that way or answer any questions that uh, that you have about that or any thoughts that you have. Is that yeah. good? Is that a good ending? What, did you, what else you got? <laughs> if anybody wants any more information on hail readiness or products we service, just reach out to Corey. Yep. Corey has a kind of good overall thought. And if he wants, you know, we can, they can bring me in and we can have a talk around it. Um, cause I'd like his coaching. I do really good with hail. Um, but sometimes with local companies, they have questions that I don't answer like on retail sales, et cetera, SEOs. So a good call with, Co with Corey and I at the same time around your hail, that would be fantastic. Maybe we'll do it on clubhouse. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be good. Sounds fun. All right, Ryan. Yeah. Thanks for, I'm glad we got this in. Um, I think it's going to be exciting. It comes out tomorrow. So, um, I'll post it in, you know, a bunch of different places, Facebook groups and on my Instagram, things like that. So, um, and we'll talk some more oh, absolutely, about the man. future of our industry. Talk to you soon. All right. See you, buddy.